Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Uh, it is Wednesday, March 31st, and we are starting on S3, which is an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. Um, as you can see, we have quite a few um, witnesses here today and uh, we, we won't get through everybody today. And I wanna thank our committee assistant, um, Evan, for working with, um, with our witnesses to uh, find out what your schedules are and your time um, constraints are, and, and, and hopefully we are accommodating everybody. Um, I also want to welcome Representative Mary Marcy of Bennington, who serves on the um, Corrections and Institutions Committee. Um, as we do the walkthrough, you'll see that this bill does touch on a number of committees' jurisdictions, and so um, I did ask Chair Emmons to have member of uh, her committee sit in with us. And so Representative Marcy, I, I welcome you as a, as a member of the committee this morning. And um, please, I don't know if I can, if you will be able to do a hand um, icon, but, but please, if you have a question, um, please jump, jump in when I turn to committee members. And, uh, and the same thing with Representative Van Donahue, welcome. I'm not sure if you are representing um, uh, House Healthcare uh, today, or you are okay, good. Because I also know that you um, have a bill in our committee that is similar to this, and so so you're wearing many hats. <laughs> um, but but you too, please um, please consider yourself a, a committee member um, for this morning. So thank thank you. Yeah, sure. And um, in terms of the um, the the uh, chat for folks who have not testified before. Um, I like to use the chat more for logistics, people who need to turn their screen off or will be right back or that type of thing, but it's 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 not a place for, for discussion. Um, you know, in terms of discussion, we'll take that from actual witness testimony, live, written, whatever, but but not not in the chat, please, that actually goes away um, when, um, when we adjourn, it's so it does not become part of the public record. So, really, is important to um, to stay on the on on the record, please. Um, we'll have a break about ten o'clock or so, and then we do have a hard stop at eleven forty-five. So, here we there we are. So, I will now turn to our legislative council. I'm not sure who wants to go first or how how are going to do it. So, I'll turn it over to both of you and welcome you and welcome. Um, Katie, I'm not sure we've seen you this session, so nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Okay. So, however, whoever wants to go first, go ahead for the walkthrough. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Grad. Um, this is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel, along with Katie McClinn from the Office of Legislative Counsel as well. Um, we're both here, as you mentioned, and uh, the as you mentioned, the we're talking to the committee this morning about uh, Senate Bill Number Three, which is an act relating to competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. So, as you can tell from the the title of the bill, that this is a, a subject area of the law that's dealing with a, basically a criminal defendant's mental health status uh, during the course of criminal proceedings. And as the chair mentioned, that's a topic that that crosses many committees' subject matters. So, crosses. Uh, criminal procedure, healthcare matters, mental health uh, related issues. And so for that reason, uh, uh, Katie and I have divvied up the bill so that I tend to cover more of the judiciary related criminal procedures and she covers more of the healthcare related matters. So um, that's why we're both here. I don't know if Katie, you wanted to add anything to that or if that sounds okay? That sounds great. Thank you. Great. Awesome. So, so when we may divvy up questions, you know, questions may come up about that sort of more geared toward ju judiciary related issues or more toward healthcare ones. So um, she and I may sort of decide how to respond based on, on what, that, what the question turns out to be. Uh, but for the most part, all, you know, the judiciary stuff tends to come in the front part of the bill and the healthcare stuff comes, tends to come later on. So that's why I'm starting off. <laughs> it just mine appears first chronologically in the bill. <laughs> so uh, having said that, um, the, as you can imagine, with a bill that deals with uh, criminal defense issues, constitutional rights of defendant, mental health care status of the defendant, uh, health care related issues, um, the, the, as I, when I often do a walkthrough, as I'm sure committee members know, 
I'll often start with sort of a, a big picture before looking at the language of the bill, sort of a general statement of the one of the, you know, the overall uh, effect of the bill. That's not really uh, something that this bill is amenable to because uh, it deals with many different pieces of the procedures related to uh, competency to stand trial and the insanity defense. It's not just one particular thing. It deal, that, that, that area of the law is detailed. There's, there's lengthy and detailed statutes on the books in both Title 13, the criminal code, and Title 18, the health care law, that all bear upon this issue. And um, what S3 does is it makes a number of different changes to different parts of those statutes. It doesn't do any one particular thing. So uh, uh, not really, as I say, amenable to me saying, well, here's the big picture, one thing that the bill does. It does a lot of different things related to these procedures. Um, so, uh, and the only way we're gonna be able to see that really is to look at the text of the bill and describe what each particular proposed change is. The one point I would make in the big picture sense before we do look at the text is that um, although, although both you know, sort of the unifying theme of what's going on in the bill is that it's making changes to the procedures that come up related to the mental health status of a defendant in a criminal proceeding. That's sort of the big picture of what's going on. And, and uh, while the um, insanity defense and competent, competency to stand trial both certainly do deal with that. They both deal very, you know, exactly with that, the mental health status of a criminal defendant the two things are very different. They're, they're, they deal with different things and they have different consequences. So if you think about, uh, first of all, the insanity defense, I just want to talk for a moment about, so we have a bit of a grounding as to what these two things are. Um, the insanity defense deals with the defendant's mental health status at the time the offense is committed. So that particular point in time, the mental health status at that time. And um, what, what the defense provides is, that uh, a person, if a person cannot either understand that his or her conduct is criminal, or they can't conform their conduct to the requirements of the law, and if those things are happening as a result of a mental illness, then the person is not guilty by reason of insanity. So that's the gist of it. If, if as a result of a mental illness, either the person uh, cannot understand that their conduct is criminal, or even if they can understand it, they still can't conform their conduct to legal requirements. Again, specifically as a result of a mental illness, not for some other reason, um, then the person is not guilty by reason of insanity. And an important point to remember about that is that if, if you're found not guilty by reason of insanity, uh, then it's a complete defense. In other words, you can't be charged with the crime ever again. It's a complete defense. And the uh, if you think about that, there's some logic to that because it's the idea is that a person at the time that committed the offense is incapable of forming the, the uh, criminal intent that would be required ordinarily of a criminal defendant. So um, that's the way the insanity defense works. On the other hand, competency to stand trial deals with the mental health status of the defendant at the time of the trial. Totally different point in time, right? Nothing to do with the defendant's mental health status at the time the offense was committed. Only... Uh, the only inquiry is the time of the trial. And if at that point, uh, the person is either unable to understand the criminal charges against them or sort of unable to participate meaningfully in their own defense. So if they either can't understand the nature of the charges or, or can't defend themselves, then they would be deemed incompetent to stand trial. Again, very different consequence though. A person who is found incompetent to stand trial can regain competence competency later on in the future and still be charged with the offense. So you see the difference between the insanity defense. That person, is, it's a complete defense. They can never be charged again. On the other hand, competency has to do with whether you are sufficiently competent to participate in the trial. And that can change over time. The person can have treatment, for example, and regain competency. And the prosecution can, if the prosecution uh, in the first instance could always decide you know, whether they want to keep the charges in place or dismiss the charges, if a person is incompetent, they could always make that decision. But assuming that they've decided uh, uh, to um, maintain the charges against the defendant, they could be charged, you know, a year, two years, three years, whenever the person regains competency after treatment later on. Um, and that's 
kind of the basics of of what these two these two proceedings are these two uh two ways that the defendant's mental health status uh, can come up in a criminal case as i say they're both both deal with mental health status of the defendant but they're very different in uh, when they're proven and and what their effects are so with that as background i would tend to move to you know uh the proceedings around these things, as I said, are very detailed. There's a lot of statutes about them. What S3 does is it proposes a number of changes to these statutes. Best way to look at that is to look at the bill. So unless you, you want me to pause for a moment, Representative Grant. Yeah, yeah, I just want to make sure that committee members understand the, um, the distinction and don't have, um, have any questions. Not seeing any hands. And again, Representative Marcy, please um, feel free to jump in. Um, Tom, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I was a little confused. I don't know if anybody else was. But <laughs> so if somebody somebody uh, commits a crime and, and, and they're found incompetent to stand trial, but uh, uh, after, say, treatment or a period of time down the road, they could be found competent to stand trial? Yes, that's exactly right. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I need to go see what my dog is talking about. I'm sorry. So go ahead, Ann and Tom, if you so, take over. I'll be yeah, right back. So, yeah, so, so Eric, I, I guess I really don't understand that. If somebody is found incompetent at the time that they committed the crime, no, that's the distinction, Representative Burdick. They're not being found incompetent at the time they committed the crime. They're being found incompetent to stand trial. So that oh. race, they, they still would have to have been, been found uh, not insane at the time of the offense, certain. Uh, you know, that's, we'll get to sort of something in the bill that kind of goes into that sequence issue. But, uh, but remember, the competency issue is only to do with how competent you are at the moment of the trial. It's got nothing to okay. do with what happened at the offense. So presuming that a person was um, uh, sane at the time of the offense, then you know if they're incompetent to stand trial, that can be uh, ameliorated by treatment over time. And okay, and yeah, okay, person, okay. Yeah. So so if if they're found insane at the time of the uh, of the crime, then they can't be tried. Exactly. Ever. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. That's yeah. That's a big distinction right there. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Anne. Um, sure. Thanks. I, I guess I want to step back coming from the mental illness, mental health perspective um, and, and ask Eric to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think a lot of times people don't like using the words of the statute, which talk about mental disease or defect rather than just saying mental health status. But I think the distinction is really important because mental illness, um, apart from legal terminology, is very different from the other kinds of mental status that come under this statute. So when we just talk about mental health or mental illness, it's not including all of the other things that are covered under these statutes. Um, developmental disability, traumatic brain injury, which are not mental illnesses. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in the back of your mind because when you change one part of the statute and you don't change others, you're enhancing the real discrepancies that are built into this statute, which has been changed over time in bits and pieces, but not as a comprehensive look at alignment. So this new bill is an example of that because it's really only addressing the mental health, the actual mental illness components, but there are all these other components. And whenever the reference is made to the mental health status of the defendant, it's actually any of the, any of the uh, conditions that qualify under the statutory definition under criminal law as a mental disease and defect. It's not just uh, mental illness. Is is that a fair description, Eric? Or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 
So I guess I'm I'm reacting a little bit again from the you know person with a mental illness perspective. Um, when when we think of it only that way, we're we're labeling one group of people when it's a legal concept that uh, has to do with the ability to appreciate wrongfulness and so forth, and which incorporates a lot of other conditions uh, that might cause that status than mental illness. And whether those procedures align, I think, is an important thing to keep in mind as you um, look at the changes that the Senate bill has. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom, for taking over. Um, okay. okay, I'm not sure where, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where we were. Eric, you still? No, we were just, just still. I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say the same thing you were probably, which is just that still entertaining questions on sort of the introductory piece and, and comments and um, still pausing to see if there's any more but before I, we look at the text of the bill. Great, thank you, thank you. Not not seeing anybody. Okay, great. Go ahead. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I'm going to share share my screen now, and we'll we'll dive into the the text and see the particular changes uh, that are proposed by S three. Just a reminder for um, committee members when the um, when screen sharing is happening, it's it's harder for me to see everybody's hands. So, committee members, if I don't recognize you, please please jump in. And again, that includes representatives Donahue and, and Marcy. Okay, looks good, Eric. Okay, everybody, see it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yes. Thank you. So this is S three as passed by the Senate. Um, and as I say, the sections tend to deal with discrete parts of the proceedings that are involved in uh, competency and, and the insanity defense. So uh, we'll take them one by one. The first section deals with um, when, when the question of a defendant's sanity or, or competency has been raised, then the court is required to order a psychiatric examination of the defendant. Um, standard practice in these, in these proceedings, it's a requirement that the psychiatric examination be, be conducted. Uh, the, as I just explained, though, you remember from the explanation, we were talking about the differences between competency and sanity at the time of the offense, but it's really just a wording issue here. The, the way the statute is worded now, you'll see that in the struck through language in subdivisions one and two, um, that the, that the psychiatric examination has to, uh, has to examine both competency and sanity. But as I, as we were just talking about, the two things are different, and it may well be that that competency is raised in a case, but not sanity, or vice versa. So there's no real reason in terms of uh, resources and and uh, what's required in a given proceeding for the psychiatric examination to always evaluate both competency and sanity. So all this does is it just makes clear that the psychiatric examination can can involve uh, evaluating one or both of the following. Everybody see that doesn't so it doesn't have to be both in every circumstance. It could be competency, could be sanity, or it could be both, depending on the circumstances of the particular case. Uh, that's the first piece that you see in subsection A there. Um, just some technical matters in subsection C. But another thing that's added here at the bottom of subsection C, you'll see, is that um, after the examination is completed, uh, the the Existing language you see talks about who the report, the, the report of the from the psychiatric examination, who it has to be transmitted to, it has to be given to the court, state's attorney, uh, the, the defendant or respondent's attorney, if, if they're represented by counsel. And this just adds the commissioner of health to that list. So the commissioner of mental, sorry, the commissioner of mental health um, also would receive a copy of that report, which will make sense, uh, as you see from the rest of the language as we go through it, since the, the Department of Mental Health is very much involved uh, in these proceedings as to um, uh, not only with respect to uh, the defendant defendant's status, but where the defendant's going to be potentially committed for treatment. So it makes would make sense for the uh, department to get I a have, copy of that, that report. I have a, a question yeah. here. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, 
Eric, did, did the committee, did the Senate committee at all discuss also including the commissioner of, uh, of Dale, about, of uh, independent living and aging, because they have jurisdiction. The paragraph just before references competency for a person with a developmental disability, which is a psychologist evaluation. And the Department of Mental Health, the Commissioner of Mental Health has no jurisdiction or involvement if the person is not competent because of a developmental disability. Did they discuss including uh, Dale there? I don't, and I always give a little qualifier to, the, to these responses because you know, it's, put, it's always potentially true that the committee discussed something when I wasn't there or that I missed it, but I don't recall them talking about that. I'd maybe ask Katie as well if she recalls it, but I, I don't myself. I give the same disclaimer that I, I am often not in the room and I, I don't recall a conversation on that point. Should I make a note of it though for potential inclusion? Does that make, make sense? Yes, please do. Yeah, I've made a note of it, of it too. So Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you, Ann. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I should say my comments because I don't think the note here really addresses the underlying problem with, uh, with, the, with the way that the Senate addressed the overall issue. Okay. So. Okay, well. That's, that's an example, I guess that's an example of a far deeper and broader um, issue with the, with the uh, laws that exist. Okay, all right, thank you. Should I go to the next, next subdivision? Yes. All right, so this, now we're, again, still, still uh, talking about this issue of competency and, and uh, sanity being two different legal constructs. Um, this paragraph, so this subdivision two, deals with, with those cases where, where issues regarding both the defendant's sanity and the defendant's competency have been raised, and the psychiatrist or psychologist who's conducting the examination um, has, been, has, in this case, has been asked to provide an opinion as to each one. Remember, we're saying that they might not, it might be they're only asked to provide an opinion as to one or the other, but if they're asked uh, to provide an opinion as to both, as to each one, uh, what subdivision two does is, is says that um, that the that the sanity examination uh, only has to be undertaken if the defendant is first found competent to stand trial. If you think about that logically, this kind of goes to what Representative Burdett was getting at with his question as well. Is that um, if the defendant is is not competent to stand trial, then in some you know there, again there's sort of an under, underlying logic to the fact that. Um, if the defendant is incompetent to stand trial, then it, it isn't uh, necessarily needed or useful yet to determine whether the person was uh, sane or not at the time of the offense. Because if they're incompetent to stand trial, then the trial is not going to happen. It's going to, and it's only going to happen uh, at, at, w at the point in time, either when or if the person regains competency. And at that point, uh, you may well want to do uh, the psychiatric examination of the person's sanity at the time of the offense. But until that time, until the trial actually happens, if it ever happens, there's no need to do it. So that's why I think this language provides that um, uh, the, the examination of the person's sanity doesn't take place. It, it shall only be undertaken, if you look at the language, if the psychiatrist or psychologist is able to form the opinion that the person is competent. Hey, Eric. Yeah, Bob. Um... Oh, I, okay. Sorry, Tom, did you, I, go ahead. I, no, go ahead, go, uh, have Bob go. I, I didn't even put my hand up because, uh, okay. well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Bob and then Tom. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Eric, not that it's going to change anything here in, in the bill or whatever else, but uh, <clears throat> a lot of uh, the things that we do and pass and so on and so forth are data-driven. Is there any data on... Um, how often a person's competency comes up in the state of Vermont uh, versus uh, a person's sanity and, and the outcomes of, of both of those uh, very complex issues? I, I, would, I would think that, uh, that the court would have that data. I, I'd be a question for the court, but I think it's certainly how frequently uh, competency to stand trial and the insanity defense are raised 
uh, would would likely be uh, data that the court could get. But I don't, I don't have it myself handy. All right, thank you. Yeah, Eric, I, I guess um, if you could give me an example. So somebody commits a crime uh, it, at some point, they're deemed not to be uh, insane, uh, but they're not competent to stand trial. Um, I, I guess if, if you could come up with a, a hypothetical or a scenario, maybe that that that, that could happen. In my, I mean, in my in my mind, I, and I know they're not the same thing as far as insanity and incompetence, but it, it, somewhere in my mind, I'm looking at them as being uh, the same or at least similar, I guess. Well, if you think of the, if I'm understanding your question correctly, it, just sort of think of it as a timeline and a person, uh, uh, you know, could well be competent at the time that the person commits a crime. Yeah. Uh, but but because, but you know, a trial, the, the the length of time between a crime and a trial is frequently uh, quite lengthy. <laughs> so oh. it could well well be during that interim period of time that the person either uh, you know develops uh, a condition or mental illness, or the person has had one before that was being treated at the time of the crime, but isn't being treated later. But for whatever reason. Because you know that intervening time, um, the person could then become uh, uh, incompetent to stand trial, and that since that decision is really focused on the time of trial, um, you know it could well have been that the person was perfectly fine at the time of the crime, but because of intervening circumstances, whatever they may be, uh, they wouldn't be competent. You know, six years, a year, eighteen months down the road, when, whenever that was that the that the trial was scheduled for. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. So moving on to section two. So uh, again, see, remember- Eric, I, I'm sorry, um, I see Kate's hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's okay, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm off camera for a moment. Um, yes. I, I just had a question about that last section. Um, it was on uh, page two, at the top of page two, number two. So that piece seems to be written, I guess I'm, it's written, okay, if the psychiatrist or psychologist has been asked to provide opinions as to both the person's company, the blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm trying to understand why, why it felt important to distinguish that the following things apply only in that particular situation. So like, um, like why why would we not instead say and I'm not trying to get too much into the the language of the bill but like why would we not instead just say you know opinions related to competency and a person's sanity at the time of an alleged offense shall be presented in separate reports um, you know examinations of a person's sanity will only be undertaken if a person is able to form the opinion that the person is competent, like why would we make that specific to when a provider is doing an assessment on both at one time? Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know that that issue was discussed specifically. Some of the witnesses might have some thoughts on that. The only thought that comes to mind for me is that is that if only one, if you sort of think of it as there's two possibilities, right? One possibility is that that the that the treatment uh, the treating psychiatrist or psychologist will be asked to provide both or one or the other. And if they're only asked to provide one or the other, then almost by definition, it's going to be in a, a separate report. Whereas the, the only sort of fact circumstance that might require some clarity about them being in separate reports is if they're required to conduct an examination of both. But again, that's just off the top of my head as to why that distinction might be there. I don't know that uh, it, it was it was uh, sort of hashed through in that kind of detail. Okay, so the the second piece, and may, and maybe this is then a question for other witnesses as it comes up. But so the second piece of that paragraph where it talks about the examination of a person's sanity shall only be undertaken if the psychiatrist or psychologist is able to form the opinion that the person is competent to stand trial. Is that not 
is that not clarified in other parts of the statute? Like, would again, regardless of whether the the reports were pursued at the same time, is there another place in the law, or is this the only place in the law where it clarifies that um, you could only pursue a sanity defense if it was determined the person was competent? Um. I think this is the place that that's made clear. I don't think it's about the ability to pursue the defense. It's just about the examination, um, uh, the, that the order of the examinations would only proceed in that way. It's not saying that the, that the defendant can't pursue the defense uh, if, if the, uh, only, only after having been found competent. I think as a, as a logical matter, that's probably the way it would play out, but, um, But again, I do think okay. some of the some of the folks who who some of your witnesses who who have a great deal of daily you know experience practicing in these proceedings on a, a day to day basis might have some some good uh, testimony for that question as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken. Uh, good morning. So I was going to ask this before, and then Tom asked it, and I thought. I had it answered, and now I'm I'm looking at, at paragraph two here. If a person that does something wrong is incompetent at that time, when they come to trial and they're found competent they're still not going to be charged back at that crime because they were incompetent, correct? Uh, could you could you run through that that one more time? I'm sorry about that, uh, Representative Gosselin. I was it lost me right in the middle there. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> sorry. If a person at the time of the crime Right. was ruled incompetent when it's time for them to stand trial for this crime and they're found competent can they be charged for that crime that they were found incompetent on before well um we have to be careful about the terminology here competency only is an issue at the time of trial. So if they were found, however, at the time of the crime, if they were uh, insane at the time of the crime, then remember, they can never be charged. They, they won't be, they, they, the trial will never happen because they couldn't form the, the criminal intent necessary to commit the crime in, term, in terms of the law. So if, they, if their insanity defense is successful, uh, and they're found uh, insane at the time of the crime, then the trial will never happen. So uh, the competency issue only comes up with someone uh, who is able to stand trial and therefore at least at, up to that point, by definition is um, at least has not, let's say the person has not had a successful insanity defense. In other words, they weren't able to show that they were insane at the time of the defense or it may never, they may never have raised it at all if, because of, I was talking about with respect to Representative Burdett's question, maybe it just wasn't an issue. The mental health status wasn't an issue at the time of the crime, but it becomes an issue later on. Um, that person, uh, even if they're incompetent to stand trial at the time of the trial, could regain competence later on uh, and then be, be brought, brought back into court for the, for the criminal trial. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, I think I'm going to wait to hear from everybody and then ask questions. Okay. <laughs> now, it's please, Ken, please ask your questions uh, along the way. And yeah, you know, I'm thinking this might be a um, maybe a flow chart or something might be might be helpful. Um, so, for, so for I I guess know. where I'm going. I mean. I don't want to. I don't want to jump the 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 what would what I think this bill is trying to accomplish, 
But it's like if somebody, when it comes time that they come to trial and they're found competent, if that's a if that's a word. That's correct. That's the right word. Then it's basically making it so they have a second chance uh, dealing with society. And I'm, I'm going to use this as a term, and it's probably wrong, but we know I, I'm never uh, uh, politically correct. But it's kind of like an expungement where you'll get like a second chance. Uh, I think uh, the the trial. There's only one. There's only going to be one trial, and the question is, you know, whether the person is competent at that time. Now, it's true that uh, if the person is is found incompetent, that uh, uh, they could still, and then then they go through treatment and they they regain competency. That's true that then they could come back to court and, and have the trial at that time. But it's not really a second trial because it, because they never had the first one because they, they were found incompetent at that time. Right, I, I, I think I've got that. What I'm saying, what I'm saying, if a person goes to this trial and they're found competent, um, then at that time, they could start, for lack of a better word, uh, rebuilding their lives, going through pop, proper treatment and all that stuff. And um, they had had a, 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 a moment or whatever, but it's like they getting a second chance or, or something like that. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say, Eric? Yeah, I think I, I think that's fair fair way to put it, yeah. Yeah, and and Ken, I think the witnesses will help talk, you know, talk to that that point as as well. Okay, Th thank you. You bet. Okay, great. No, no other questions at the moment, or not seeing them. Okay, not hearing anybody? Yeah. So now we're moving on to section two deals a, a, a further you're further down the road in these proceedings now remember we were just talking about that once once a person's a defendant's sanity or competency has been raised the court has to order a, a psychiatric uh, evaluation um, so now this is further down the proceedings though so if if uh, the court does find that the person is either was either insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial. So again, think of it sort of chronologically, we're, we're a little further down the road. The court has found in this, when we get to this statute, that um, that uh, the defendant was in, you know, insane at the time of the offense or incompetent to stand trial. At that point, after that finding, the court has to hold a hearing to determine uh, what should happen to the person next. And to use a phrase that this committee has has heard many times over the years, the question at that hearing is whether the person is a danger to self or others. So the court, that's this section 4820, hearing regarding commitment. And the, and, the, and the dispositive question, the crucial question in that hearing is, is the person a danger to self or others? If the answer to that question is yes, uh, uh, then the person has to be committed to the Department of Mental Health for treatment. So, uh, Everybody sort of understand that so far. And so I'm sure it reminds folks of the, the way civil proceedings work as well. If the person's a danger to self or others, uh, then they're committed for treatment to the Department of Mental Health. Now, currently, um, the way this criminal provision works is that the person's defense counsel, their de criminal defense attorney, continues to represent them at that hearing, at that commitment hearing. Um, however, if you think that that commitment hearing is no longer a criminal proceeding, it's a proceeding about uh, whether the person is a danger to self or others, not whether they're guilty of a crime or not. It's not a criminal uh, determination. It's whether they're a danger to self or others. And so what Section 2 provides for is that in that hearing, um, uh, the person is entitled to have counsel appointed from Vermont Legal Aid to represent the person. This is the, the, uh, the organization, the body with the, with, has uh, significant experience representing 
uh, persons who are in this position of having to determine danger to self or others. And as a practical matter, Vermont Legal Aid has been involved in these proceedings sometimes uh, in any event, but this formalizes it and makes it uh, um, a right that the defendant has. Now I say, you see the language shall be entitled to have counsel appointed from Vermont Legal Aid. That doesn't mean that the person is required to. The person, if they have, for example, a private attorney, private counsel, they could certainly choose to continue to have their private attorney in the proceedings, but um, but they'll have counsel appointed from legal aid if they choose not to do that. Um, and the second, the last sense of that subsection you see is another part of the proceeding that uh, says that uh, the Department of Mental Health is also entitled to appear and call witnesses at the proceeding. proceeding. Again, here, you think about it, the, the question in this proceeding is when is whether the person is gonna be committed to the custody the Department of Mental Health. So there's some logic behind permitting the department to appear at the proceeding uh, and um, present testimony on that question. So that's that section. Going to move on to section three. I'm not hearing any other questions. Uh, all right. So now, so again, we're, we're, Keep, keep in mind, we're kind of moving along the chronology of the proceedings now. So in this case, we're, we're if the, again, if the, court, if the court, after the hearing that we just looked at, if the court does find that the defendant uh, is a danger to himself or others, and, and they commit the person um, to, to the Department of Mental Health's custody for treatment, then this next section deals with uh, uh, notice to the crime victim when that person returns to the community. There's nothing in current law that provides you know, after a person is committed uh, to the department for treatment, and uh, the person, you know, after being treated under various scenarios, may be returned to the community. There's nothing in current law that provides notice to the victim of the crime, because remember, this is only folks who have gone into the system through the criminal justice system. It's not dealing with folks who went into the department's custody through the civil process. These are only folks who are coming in through the through the criminal avenue. And um, there is likely a victim of whatever criminal act took place. And the, the proposal here is to create a system of victim notification for when, uh, when the person who, who is in the department's custody is returned to the community. So that's the big picture of what's going on here. It's a victim notification system uh, for when persons who have been uh, uh, committed to the department as a result of a criminal proceeding uh, end up being returned to the community. So under section three, this victim notification requirement applies. Where are we here? I think I'm going further down here. I may have, oh yeah, here we are. Um, so this victim notification requirement uh, that is gonna, I'll talk about in detail here because there's a lot to it. It applies uh, uh, if a defendant has committed to the Department of Mental Health custody after having been found, and I'm at the very beginning here, Roman numeral one and two, after having been found either not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial, provided the person's criminal case has not been dismissed. Now, what that means, that second subdivision, Roman numeral two, is that, as you can see, so, so, so this victim notification requirement applies to everybody who's been found, who, who after, who's been committed after having been found not guilty by reason of insanity, but it doesn't apply to everybody who's been committed after being found incompetent. It's only those who are, who are, um, found incompetent and the person's criminal case has not been dismissed. What does, does that mean? Kind of goes back to what I was saying very early on in this walkthrough. Um, remember the prosecution doesn't necessarily have to uh, keep the criminal charges in place against the person after they've been found incompetent. I'm sure the practitioners will talk more about this as well, but it's not unusual for a person to be incompetent for a very minor offense. It might be shoplifting or or something like that. And um, that could well be uh, a case where the prosecution says, well, it's really not uh, helpful to the person or a wise use of resources or in any way impact community safety to proceed with a criminal case against someone who's found, found incompetent for you know, shoplifting of uh, something very minor. So the prosecution in those cases, it's not unusual for them to just dismiss the case. In those sorts of cases, um, the policy decision here is it's not, it's not necessary to provide any victim notification for that minor uh, proceeding. So 
On the other hand, if the prosecution has kept the criminal charges, kept the criminal case going, has not dismissed the criminal case, there's sort of presumption there that that would be a more serious matter, uh, and that would be one in which victim notification would be required. So that's the reason for that distinction uh, in the beginning as to who, you know, in what cases does this victim notification requirement kick in? So um, when notice, what, let's say when notice is required, okay, if, if this victim notification component uh, kicks in and is required, then the commissioner has to provide it under three different circumstances. And that's what we'll look at now. Um, excuse me, Eric, one, the, um, excuse yep. me, um, Representative Donahue's his hand is up. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to understand and follow um, the, the term uh, victim under the victim of the offense. And I understand that if a crime occurred, then there's a victim of the crime. But if a defendant uh, never stood trial, the charges are maybe still are, are still pending, but there's never been a conviction. So we don't know legally whether that individual actually was the perpetrator of the crime that created a victim. So the reference victim of the offense being notified because a person who was accused of a crime, is that, is that what we're talking about? Because it seems to imply that this, that this person did in fact uh, do the crime and create a victim when that was never established. Am I following that correctly? Well, I, I don't know that I would agree that it wasn't established uh, in some evidentiary way, but I think you're, you're correct that, that uh, the, there has been no adjudication of guilt, yes. Um, so but, what, what, in what way was it established in some evidentiary way in, in the process we've talked about so far? Well, I think the, the, uh, the practitioners, I think, will be, will be able to better describe that. But I think it's, you know, it's going to involve the, the affidavits and the, the, uh, the initial proceedings that the prosecutor would have brought to begin the the criminal proceeding in the first place, you know, whether it be an indictment or a information, those could potentially create evidence of who the victim was, if there was. So, but, but there's never been any, any uh, fine, no, there's never been a legal finding that that person was the one who committed the crime that created a victim. Is that, is that right? Well, there's no adjudication of guilt. That's correct. Right. I, I don't know. Okay. Right. Any any other questions here before we're moving forward? Or yeah. so. No, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So as I was mentioning, the uh, this notice, this victim notice that we're talking about. Um, is required, it kicks in when, when sort of one of three or four, depending on how you look at it, circumstances occurs. And the first one is um, at least 10 days. So this is, and you see who, who does the notice have to be provided to? I'm sorry, I covered that. That's in B1 right there. Um, the commission has to provide notice to the state's attorney of the county where the prosecution originated or to the office of the attorney general if that office prosecuted the case. Because remember, it could be either they have concurrent jurisdiction, either office could prosecute a criminal case. But whoever whoever prosecuted has to get the notice, and the notice, and when does when does the notice required? Well, here's circumstance number one: at least ten days prior to discharging the person from the care and custody of the commissioner, or um, uh, commitment in a hospital, a secure or secure residential facility to the community. And this is a discharge, so uh, on an order of non-hospitalization, which is referred to as an O and H. So at least 10 days before either one of those two things happening, AA or BB. After either the person is discharged, right, from, from uh, the commissioner's custody. So presumably the treatment has been successful and the person is discharged. Um, or BB, uh, the, uh, they aren't fully discharged from the commissioner's custody, but they are, their treatment is changed. Uh, from a hospitalization or a secure residential facility to the community on what's known as an order of non-hospitalization. So they're still being treated in the community. They are still 
uh, under the custody of the commissioner. In other words, they're not fully discharged. They're still under the, the department's custody, but they're being treated in the community. And remember, as I said at the beginning, this, this whole victim notification piece is kicking in under various circumstances under which a person who has been hospitalized may be returning to the community. So that's kind of the big picture unifying circumstance that's going on here. Whenever someone who's been hospitalized for treatment, um, having come through the criminal justice system to the department's custody, when they are returning to the community, uh, under one way or another, and this is what we're talking about right now, how, how might that happen? How, how would they return to the community? That's when this not notification is required to the state's attorney uh, or the attorney general. So how might that person return to the community? Well, as we just saw, 1AA could be they're being discharged from custody completely. Under 1BB, it could be that, well, they're not being discharged completely, but they are being sort of stepped down uh, in treatment level from uh, hospital commitment or commitment in a secure residential facility, recovery facility to an ONH, an order of non-hospitalization. So they're being treated in the community. Again, in, a person is uh, uh, moving to that level. Um, so that's uh, either one of those things happen, notification requirement kicks in. Another, another way a person might go to the community, you look at subdivision two, uh, at least 10 days prior to the expiration of a commitment order issued under this section if the commissioner doesn't seek continued treatment. So what that means is that, um, again, the person has been committed. There's been this commitment order issued by the court. They were committed to the Department of Mental Health custody. But uh, the way those orders work, uh, the initial commitment order uh, lasts for a, a 90 days. It's a maximum period of 90 days. And it can only be 90 days. Now, if the person, if the, what often happens is when these, well, I shouldn't say it often happens, sometimes it happens, it can happen. Uh, the, uh, when the order reaches the end, coming up on the end of its uh, effective period. So again, that initial order has to be for 90 days. There, the a department can uh, uh, seek a continued, an order of continued treatment. So in other words, if the person is still a danger to self or others, they can be continued beyond that 90 day period. And that, that uh, order for continued treatment has a maximum period of one year. So initial order can be up to 90 days, then continue, the order for continued treatment can be up to a year, still has to have to always be able to make that showing that the person is danger to self or others. Um, but so if you think about how that could work, let's say the person was committed initially for 90 days and then they've got a second one year order in place, it could be another way, and again, we're talking about ways that a person may be returned to the community. As that one year period starts to start to come to the end, as you start to come to the end of that, that one year uh, effective period of the order, uh, the department has to make a decision as to whether or not the person uh, should be subject to an or another order for continued treatment for up to another year or not. They could decide just to let the order expire. They decide the person is uh, no longer needs treatment um, they could let the order, because remember, it's only going to be effective for a maximum of another year. They could let the, decide to let the order expire, and when it does, the person is free to return to the community. Again, that's not an actual formal discharge. So in other words, it, it wouldn't come under, it wouldn't be exactly the same as what we just described, this, this formal decision to discharge a person uh, uh, that we talked about in sub Roman numeral one. So this is covering another circumstance under which a person could return to the community after having been committed to the, de to the department's custody. If that period expires, they don't seek an order for continued treatment. Um, so they're gonna return to the community under, uh, for that reason, then, um, then notice is required as well. So that's number two. And lastly, uh, number three, when also notice is also re required, but when the person absconds from the custody of the commissioner. So in other words, the person uh, flees or escapes from the custody of the commissioner. Um, again, another way that they might be in the community that wouldn't come under one or two. And the idea here again is that this notification to the state's attorney or the attorney general is required. Uh, and then the, the next question obviously is uh, uh, when the state's attorney or what happens when, the, when they get that notice, when the SA or the AG receives the notice, well, you see in Roman numeral two there, what's required is that they have to provide notice of the action. In other words, whatever, whatever action the department took 
to any victim of the offense who has not opted out of receiving notice. So the point there is that it's going to be an opt out structure so that a victim has the ability to say they'd rather not get the notice. And if that's the case, they won't get it. But uh, but um, if they haven't done that, then they would receive the notice and any more uh, when any one of the circumstances that we just described happens. Uh, excuse me, and I assume that your hand is up from before or okay. I think my I think, apology. <laughs> I, I think you're good. Okay, great. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you. Sorry, was there other other questions too, or no? Or I think we're good. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, so the uh, the and I was just going to get to the for a moment to the. Um, victim definition, because that was something that Representative Donahue was alluding to as well, because it cross-references the definition of victim in um, uh, that's in the criminal the crime victims statute, and that defines victim as a person who sustains physical, emotional, or fin financial injury or death as a direct result of the commission or attempted commission of a crime or act of delinquency. So at so any time it's crime is committed or attempted to be committed. Um, so that's that's the definition you have in existing law. So what what we just talked about was um, notification when a person is returned to the community under one uh, process or another. There's also a separate. Uh, notification piece that we're now looking at sub subdivision C. Now this applies only to in situations where a person is already in the community under a non-hospitalization order. So in other words, they've already they've already uh, been in custody of the department and they've been um, they've been placed in the community on a non-hospitalization order. And I'm going to just for a moment, if I can, switch us to the non-hospitalization order statute so folks can see how that works. So this is in Title 18, um, judicial proceedings are related to these uh, proceedings that we're talking about now. So this non-hospitalization order uh, can happen when a court finds that a treatment program other than hospitalization is adequate to meet the person's treatment needs. And in that case, uh, the court orders the person to receive whatever treatment other than hospitalization is appropriate for a period of 90 days. So this is a non-hospitalization order. ONH person can get the treatment in the community. So um, if that's happened, that the court has made that order, the person's in uh, the community under an ONH, uh, this is a separate notification piece that requires the commissioner to provide notice, again, uh, to the state's attorney uh, or the office of the attorney general, and in this case, you'll notice to the committing court, so the court that issued the order as well, uh, any time that the commissioner becomes aware that either one of two things, either the person is not complying with the order, so they're in the community on this ONH, and, but they're not complying, or that the alternative treatment, whatever it is that's going on in the community, has not been adequate to meet the person's treatment needs. So when the, if the commissioner becomes aware of that, the commissioner has to provide that notice to the court. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the court, but also the, uh, the prosecuting office, whether that was the SA or the AG. Um, just to go back to the statutory language again, so because that language um, uh, certainly begs the question of, well, what does this mean? Just to so the committee knows it, it didn't come out of nowhere. The, um, it's the same language that's in the O and H statute currently. So if you look at subsection B, again, in this case, it's referring to the court, not the commissioner. But if it comes to the attention of the court that the patient is not complying with the order, or that the alternative treatment has not been adequate to meet the patient's treatment needs. So if the court becomes aware of that, then the court may, after a hearing, do one of two things. You consider other alternatives, modify its order, its original order, um, you know, direct the patient to undergo a different per alternative treatment program, or uh, enter a new order um, of hospitalization for the remainder of the 90-day period. So it can recommit the person uh, to a hospital. Um, so. That's just so that you're familiar with the existing statute. In that case, it's the court becoming aware of it. Uh, and the proposed language here is that if the commissioner becomes aware that that's happening, this person's in the community on the ONH, 
um, then they have to notify again the prosecutor uh, as to uh, what has been happening. There is not, you'll see, any indication in this language as to what the uh, uh, attorney general or the state's attorney will do with the information once they get notified with it. And there was some discussion about that uh, in the committee downstairs, um, but uh, rather than resolve it, they understood the complexity of it. And you'll see when we get to the, you get to the forensic care working group, it's established that they're tasked with studying that exact issue, what to, what should happen, what should be the next process uh, when that information becomes, uh, that notification comes through. So that's the end of the victim notification piece. Uh, there's one more piece that I'm gonna talk about here in section four um, before Katie jumps in with the, the healthcare provisions, but uh, I'm pausing for a moment in case there's other questions. Thank you, Eric. I'm not seeing any hands. Um, I know I did say that we were gonna take a break around 10. I think it would be best if we finish our walk through the bill and, and then we'll take a break. So I don't wanna, break up this uh, walkthrough overview. Uh, okay, go ahead. Thank you, Eric. Sure, and I, I think we've gotten through the bulk of it, so a um, couple of more pieces, but uh, so I'll move on here to section four. This is um, uh, goes back to the procedures involved when, when, um, when the insanity defense or competency to stay in trial are being raised in, in a criminal matter. Uh, right now, under, under the rules of criminal procedure, uh, the prosecution is able to have its own psychiatrist or, or other expert conduct a reasonable mental examination of the defendant um, when the defendant has pr provided notice that sanity is going to be an issue in the trial. And I should mention that, that it's re also required under the rules of criminal procedure that notice be provide provided. So when a defendant is going to raise the insanity defense, um, the criminal rules require that notice be provided to the prosecution. But in any event, when that has happened, um, uh, the prosecution is able to have its own psychiatrist conduct a, a, a mental examination of the defendant. However, the rules don't permit the prosecution to conduct its own examination when the defendant's competency is at issue. So remember, we're talking, remember, the key point, those being two different things again. The rule says prosecution can have their own psychiatrist when sanity is an issue. doesn't say anything about um, what they can do Oh, that th they should they are able to do that when competency is an issue. So rule four basically uh, uh, does so. And with that, and so it provides specifically that the same thing that's that's uh, allowed now when sanity is an issue, it will allow uh, proposes to allow when competency is an issue and require the defendant to uh, allow the prosecution to uh, require the defendant to submit to a reasonable mental examination, which you see is the same language that's used in the existing language right above. Right in the lines right above the new, the new underlying language, you'll see that uh, when notice is given by the defendant that sanity is an issue, then they can have the defendant submit to a reasonable mental examination by a psychiatrist or other expert. So that language is, is repeated here for competency proceedings. Uh, now this is, uh, I should point out two things that about this is that, um, and I'll actually go back to one other point about the uh, victim disclosure piece as well, just because a couple of legal points I want uh, the committee to be aware of. With respect to this one, um, the this this is in response to a Vermont Supreme Court case called uh, State v. Sherrill, which held that um, that the prosecution could not get this uh, could not have a its own mental examination in a competency proceeding because the language did not provide for it. You see here, as we just pointed out, the language does provide for it uh, with respect to sanity proceedings, uh, but not competency. So uh, this is the response to that decision. Should point out here though, that the, um, that the various parties, including the attorney general and the defender general have different opinions as to whether or not this might raise constitutional issues uh, with respect to due process and self-incrimination, uh, but they they both have put forth their positions on that. It's not something that's been fully resolved uh, by the Vermont Supreme Court, so it shouldn't be a surprise if that gets litigated. Uh, but the um, uh, the 
Senate decided to include it, uh, feeling comfortable that it could be defended, uh, but knowing also that it um, will very likely be litigated and the court would have the final say. Uh, and my last piece before I will uh, transition to Katie is the um, going back for a moment, something I neglected to mention with respect to victim notification. Uh, that, that requirement of uh, providing notice of those changes in the defendant's status, treatment status by the Department of Mental Health to the state's attorney and the attorney general, as well as um, the court in some circumstances. Uh, there's also been different opinions put forward as to whether that uh, could conceivably be a violation of the HIPAA privacy protection of a person's um, uh, medical information under federal law. Uh, our office has looked at that question. And again, similar to what I just said, it, not that there might be reasonable arguments on both sides, but our view is that there's a um, uh, legal basis based on case law out there to conclude that uh, that is not a HIPAA violation. Again, court might reach a different decision, can't say for sure what they would say, but there's certainly uh, a sound legal basis for um, saying that it's not a HIPAA violation so that um, Senate decided on that basis to, to uh, conclude that they were okay for now, unless a court said any differently in the future. So just wanted to give the committee full disclosure on those two points. Thank you, thank you, that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. So that brings me uh, to the end of my piece, and now we're going to, uh, I'll turn it over to Katie for the talk, uh, the walkthrough of the last couple of sections. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, as always. Yes. Thank you. And Katie, let me know if you want me to, as they want me to move the screen here. Okay. I'll let you know. Thank you. Yep. So I'm going to transition us um, to looking at various report backs and um, information that would be coming to the General Assembly for further, um, further help your decision making. So the first piece is a report that would be coming on November 1st of this year. And it's a joint inventory, a joint evaluation between the Departments of Corrections and of Mental Health. And it's looking at the mental health services that are provided by the entity that DOC contracts with for healthcare services. You can scroll down, please, Eric. And so you'll see that um, this language specifies that in this comparison, in this inventory that would be coming back, it's looking um, at the type, frequency, and timeliness of mental health services that are provided in a correctional setting, and importantly, how those services differ from the services that would otherwise be available in the community. And then the evaluation is also to address how the two departments, mental health in the Department of Corrections MOU um, impact services that are provided by the entity that DOC contracts with for healthcare services. So that is the first piece. And then if you scroll down a bit, the second piece is a forensic care working group. And there are three pieces or um, kind of three separate inquiries within this section of what this group is going to be looking at. Um, and I also wanted to know, I, you know, I kind of surprised me actually when I, I went back and, and looked at it again last night that um, it's quite a bit of work that's coming back and the time frame is between August 1st and November 1st here for these three different inquiries. So I wanted to bring that to the committee's attention. And this first paragraph, we just have that the department is con convening a work group of interested stakeholders. And you'll see there's a whole list of potential stakeholders that I'll go through. Um, but because the nature of the three inquiries that we're going to look at on the next page are different, um, the language in, um, indicates um, that the stakeholders um, working on each inquiry will be as appropriate. Um, so for example, um, a representative from BGS might not be weighing in on a policy question, but they would be weighing in on the inquiry about a facilities question. So um, depending on the particular inquiry, the group of stakeholders looking at the issue will be different. And this language isn't prescriptive as to who exactly is looking at what issue. So interested stakeholders include the Department of Corrections, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, the Office of the Attorney General, the Office of the Defender General, the Director of Health Care Reform, uh, BGS, a representative appointed by Vermont Care Partners, a representative appointed by Vermont Legal Aid's Mental Health Project, 
two crime victim representatives appointed by the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, the mental health care ombudsman, a representative of the designated hospitals appointed by Voss, and a person with lived experience of mental health, excuse me, a lived experience of mental illness and any other interested party that's permitted by the commissioner. So then we turn to looking at the, the three separate inquiries. So the first inquiry is in subdivision one. And this is um, looking at gaps in the current mental health and criminal justice system structure, opportunities to improve public safety and the coordination of treatment for individuals who are incompetent to stand trial or who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. So this is um, kind of consistent with the language we've looked at in the bill so far, looking at how these two pieces of mental health treatment and, and criminal justice and folks coming into the mental health system through the criminal justice door, um, how if there are any gaps in the services there. So specifically, the working group is to review competency restoration models that are used in other states, explore models used in other states that balance treatment and public safety risks posed by individuals found not guilty by reason of insanity. For example, psychiatric security boards, including Connecticut's model, the Connecticut Psychiatric Security Review Board, and guilty but mentally ill verdicts in criminal cases. So that is the first issue that this um, group would address. The second issue um, has to do um, more with facilities. And this is an issue that, for example, BGS would be weighing in on. So this is looking at eval evaluating various models for the establishment of a state-funded forensic treatment facility for individuals found incompetent to stand trial or who are adjudicated not guilty by reason of insanity. And then specifically, we have what the evaluation is to address here. Uh, the need for a forensic treatment facility in Vermont, the entity or entities most appropriate to operate such a facility, the feasibility and appropriateness of repurposing an existing facility for the purpose of establishing a forensic treatment facility versus constructing a new facility from scratch. In subdivision D, the number of beds that such a facility would need and the impact of repurposing an existing mental health treatment facility would have on the rest of the mental health system. And if you could scroll down, please, Eric. Yep. Um, and then lastly, the fiscal impact of constructing or repurposing such a facility, the estimated annual operation costs, and then also taking into consideration um, that what we kind of refer to as the federal IMD institutions of mental disease waiver. Um, and that's a, a federal term, that's not a Vermont term, but these are um, are federal waivers that um, govern Medicaid reimbursement and recognizing that um, those funds would not extend to provide um, somebody's um, treatment in a forensic mental health facility. And I, I see there's a hand. I'm not sure if I should pause. Thank you. Yes, Ken. Yeah. Oh, can we just back up? Why was Connecticut... Uh, brought up and not other, what, what's the reason for Connecticut, please? Um, I can't recall off the top of my head, to be honest. Um, this bill was under consideration during the last biennium, or at least portions of it were. And I know at that time, Connecticut was held up as a model. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure at this point what the specifics were, why Connecticut's model was of most interest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so we have this, the last of the three inquiries that are, are part of this um, working group. Um, so this section takes into consideration the notification process that's been proposed in this bill. Um, and so considering this notification process where the commissioner of uh, the Department of Mental Health is required to provide notification to the prosecutor upon becoming aware that the person that persons on an order of non-hospitalization are not complying with the order or that alternative treatment is not adequate to meet the person's needs. 
um, the working group is to make recommendations it deems necessary to cl clarify this process, including any recommendations as to specific facts and circumstances that should trigger the commissioner's duty to notify the prosecutor and recommendations as to the steps that the prosecutor, prosecutor should take after receiving the notification. Um, then we have language in subsection B um, that allows people who are not state employees who are participating in these working groups to be entitled to per diem and reimbursement for expenses. And then this is the language about the due date. So this work of these three different inquiries is coming back November 1st of this year. DMH is reporting on um, the results of all of these inquiries, findings and recommendations. Um, and that's coming back to the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee. And the report is to include proposed draft legislation addressing any uh, identified um, needs to change the statute. And that is it for section six. And then we have an effective date of July 1, 2021. And I will stop there, but I see there's a hand. Yeah. Go ahead, Barbara. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Chair Grant. Um, so Katie, I'm wondering a couple of things from the earlier part. I was just waiting um, and wrote my questions down. So in um, the first report that DOC is doing with Department of Mental Health, um, you were saying that they're gonna do an inventory of what's currently available versus what could, what would be provided in the community. That's not what currently is, right? Because I could picture us getting back waiting list, whatever. Is that, that I'm assuming that's saying if it were funded, what could be provided in the community, um, but maybe not. So I was looking for clarification. I, I think this is trying to capture what is, what is currently in existence. So this is asking DOC and DMH to, to take an inventory of what services are currently being offered in a correctional setting through the, the DOC's contractor um, for healthcare services, but then taking it a step further and seeing how these services that are currently offered in DOC differ from what's being offered in the community. And then they're giving, uh, it gives criteria of how to measure that in terms of the type of services, the frequency of the services provided, the timeliness of services. So within those categories, how, how do the services differ in the community and in a correctional setting? So I, I'm worried that if we don't clarify that further, what could come back is here's what is offered in at DOC. You know, we've got dedicated people and they're that got, got X caseload, if we send them to the counseling service. Um, right now we have a waiting list. We have, so it, it may be that if we said, look, we're spending a million dollars for this in corrections, if that million dollars were repurposed to our community systems, here's what would be available rather than what currently is available because there's not a mental health agency that's going to say, sure, we can on demand now serve people in prison. And so it's almost it feels like it's, it's going to be very hard to make the community resources be a viable option um, if that isn't clarified. I, I think I take your point. Um, should I, I flag this at this point to come back to it? Um, I think it's, I think the section is, well, let me back up. Are you, is your comment more about that the comparison is more of apples to oranges? Um, yeah. That we're not really comparing the same thing just because the resources in the community, the wait lists in the community are, are so different than the experience of services and corrections? Right, so if, the, if it's what is corrections currently offering, there's money going towards that. There's not money in mental health going towards that. And, you know, I've not, I've been away from community mental health for a while, but adult services were really underfunded. Um, 
years ago, and I can't imagine that's gotten much better. So it doesn't seem like I would be, if it went through, I would be shocked if it didn't come back. No, mental health is too full. We can't do this. I mean, so is the mandate, what can you do without additional money? Because then Department of Corrections needs to say what they would do if they didn't have this million dollar contract. You know what I mean? Like it's gotta be a level playing field. I'm not sure if I'm fully taking your point, but I think the the kind of the the purpose of the section is an issue of of parity to see right. what type of services are available. And I I'm wondering, and I don't, I got cut off before my my computer kicked me off, so I don't know if you heard this, but are you kind of saying it's an issue of apples and oranges that just by nature the of the um, practitioners available and the um, size of the wait list, for example, in the community, it's just that different services will be available on a different time frame than in correctional settings? For sure that, I'm sure there are other things too. Again, if we said there's $500,000 that we have for this service, let's look at what this service is now. Let's look at what that 500,000 would buy if we used our community resources. Feels different than the way it's worded now. Okay, I hear what you're saying. Um, the other part that I wondered about sort of related to that theme or is, I heard you say the contract for mental health services, is that separate? than the health, I think it is a separate contract than the health corrections contract. There may be overlap, but there's more than one health contract, right? If I said a mental health contract, then I misspoke. I, I was referring to the healthcare contract as to okay. whether there's a separate contract for mental health services. I'm not sure. Um, okay. And I would, I would have the, um, the Department of Corrections or DMH probably knows um, then ask them to weigh in on that. Okay. Um, so that also is interesting because shouldn't we also look then at like community health centers as part of the answer, not just mental health services? I know Chittenden's community health center has psychiatry, substance abuse treatment. Um, and I, I like that it's combined with health because it is health. Um, uh, the two wonder the two things that I wondered about that aren't spoken in here, but are part of um, our current contract. It's with a for-profit entity, and I don't know if we're saying let's look at for-profit and non-profit entities, um, and it's an out-of-state entity, which doesn't matter here so much to me. But I wondered when we talk about building or repurposing a building. We currently, as you know, send prisoners to Mississippi um, and we have sent them to a bunch of different states, which I'm not a fan of, but I'm wondering if that issue comes up or at least should be talked about if, it's, if we're okay with that being one of the um, options that's looked at because maybe Amherst Mass has an amazing facility and would meet our needs in a cheaper way and be closer to home and family for most people than if we repurposed a building in Highgate. Um, so I'd love to have that um, on the table. And um, again, I think the for-profit issue in some ways either needs to be thumbs up or thumbs down or discussed. So yeah, thank you, Barbara. And I think we can make note of that, that when we get into discussion or if another committee looks at this, um, we, can, we can ask them to con consider that. Thank you. And I'm not sure if it was considered in, in, the, in the Senate or not. Um, so, okay. Thank you. Okay. Should, should I pull the bull down, bill down, Representative Gred? <laughs> Um, sure. I'm not seeing any other hands. Mine down. Questions, correct? 
Well, let me just double check before we take our break um, in terms of the language in the in the bill. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Well, Katie and Eric, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was very, very thorough and I appreciate it. And, and thank you to everybody for, um, for pushing through. Um, I realize we're almost a half hour past our break time, but I thought it was important to, um, to get it all in at once. So let's uh, take a break until 1045 and then um, um, we'll get started again. And as I said earlier, um, very ambitious witness list and we'll just do what we can um, until we stop at 11.45. So we'll see you in at about um, 10.45, please. Thank you.